All right, so we covered a lot of material so far. Um, we have gone through lift and drag. Those are big concepts for external flow on objects. Uh, put them in dimensionless form, the lift coefficient, the drag coefficient. Talked about the terminal free falling speed, which first time you look at it, you think, what is this? It looks a little bit out of place, but it's an application of the drag. Okay, so we, we can calculate the drag force and then for an object that's free falling in fluid, uh, that drag force would balance the weight and also the buoyancy if there's a buoyancy force. Okay, we talked about what does the drag come from? It comes from uh, viscosity and the friction associated with viscosity and you integrate it over the surface, get the net drag, that's a skin friction. Also, it comes from having a pressure imbalance. One side, usually high pressure in the front, low pressure in the, in the back region. And that gives you the pressure drag or the form, they call it sometimes the form drag. Um, which one dominates? It depends. Some problems, the skin friction dominates and the form drag is small. Some problems, the opposite is true, okay? The, the pressure drag dominates. Separation uh, leads to typically having large wake regions behind objects that are going through fluids and increases the pressure drag. And so a lot of times the strategy is to avoid separation if you're trying to streamline an object, hence reduce the drag. And what you're going to be attacking when you streamline is to try to avoid the separation, creating a low pressure region in the back. Stokes flow, very low speed flow. Um, then you go with a higher Reynolds number flow, and it can be so high that the uh, phenomenon becomes Reynolds number independent. We see that in external flow as well as internal flow. And the drag coefficients often for high Reynolds number flows are constants. They depend on the object. But you can look in a table and say, here's the drag coefficient for whatever car you have, whatever year you have, it's out there. It, you know, somebody's measured it. Uh, so if you're looking at drag coefficient of a 19, I don't know, 97 Ford F-150 pickup, you can find it. And you're going to find a constant. And that's because they're going to quote it at a high Reynolds number where the drag coefficient's independent of Reynolds number. Flow over flat plates is where we were last time. And so let's kind of pick up there and continue on. But we're interested in the boundary layer thickness, the skin friction coefficient, talk about the critical Reynolds number. So you could have laminar flow, turbulent flow over his flat plate, et cetera. Let's pick it up there. So this was an illustration. So you have a knife edge flat plate. Flow approaches it at speed V, it's uniform velocity. And then because of the no slip boundary condition, the speed of the fluid right adjacent to that plate is zero. And so then you can get a velocity profile and it looks like this. And so far away, it's still just cap V, the free stream, sometimes V infinity, sometimes U infinity. That free stream far away uh, speed, it's uniform out there. But in this region, they call it the boundary layer the speed is less. Okay. You define the boundary layer thickness as, well, that's the distance one has to go from the flat plate into the fluid until the speed of the fluid, the time average speed of the fluid is 99% of the free stream. So I'll move further, y equal to delta, until that that speed is 99% of the free stream. And that's the definition of the boundary layer thickness. Did I mention why is it not 97.25 or something? It's just 99. It's just 99, OK? You have a, a critical a distance, a x critical, at which you can start to transition to become turbulent. So you will, if you have a long enough plate, you'll get there. 
but uh, sometimes your plate's very long and it's um, still didn't quite get there such that it's turbulent flow and it's laminar flow over the entire plate. Or sometimes the plate is whatever, just the opposite. You have very short laminar flow region and most of it's turbulent. But there's this transition point. What is this location? Well, it's, it's uh, the, the location's pegged to the value of the Reynolds number at that location. So what's the definition of Reynolds number? Rho V X over mu. So what again is this X? Distance from the leading edge. What is this V? Free streams, velocity of the fluid. The density and the dynamic viscosity or absolute viscosity mu of the fluid. And when this number gets to a half a million, that's the critical Reynolds number then observed by experiments. So that's when they would say it's going to transition from laminar flow to turbulent flow. So it always starts out at the beginning when x is equal to zero at the tip. The Reynolds number is zero. It starts laminar. And then as you go increasing distance. Maybe uh, often they'll introduce x equal to L. What is L? L is the trailing edge. So the plate is distance, has length L, zero to L, okay? And then you could talk about, well, what's the Reynolds number at the trailing edge, at the end? Did it ever get over half a million? If it never did, it's laminar flow over the whole thing. If it's well over half a million, it did, but where did it occur? You just find out the, the location, X critical, where it uh, transitioned. Um, there is a, a, a laminar, then you have a transition, then you have a fully turbulent boundary layer region where it's very, um, I don't know, I'll just use the word chaotic. It's well mixed. You have a very thick boundary layer, at, but still really close to the solid surface. You have what we call viscous sublayers, such that it's still a very um, a rapid change in the velocity profile close to the surface. Flow over a smooth flat plate. The, fun, the number to be remembered is half a million. What is the definition of the friction coefficient C sub F? Now, C sub F, you could talk about a local friction coefficient. That would be the shear stress at the surface at some location divided by one half rho V squared, the dynamic pressure. Determine the Reynolds number for flow over a flat plate. Well, we already defined that, right? That's rho V X over mu. That's the definition. So this local uh, uh, friction coefficient, tau, um, it's, it's very high. Uh, if I plotted tau, the shear stress at the wall as a function of location, it's very high early. And then uh, because it's a very rapid change in the velocity profile, actually there's a singularity here. It goes off to infinity. But then it drops, drops as it goes but then when you start to transition, what happens is, is this layer in here is well mixed, but the at time average velocity profile isn't that severe. The profile becomes very steep again at the surface, and so it transition goes up. Now what you do is you take that shear stress at the wall and you normalize it to have the local friction coefficient, and you get the same profile. So that's what they're showing you. Uh, is this one dimensionless? Yes. Is this one dimensionless? No. This one has units of newtons per meter squared. It's the shear stress, viscous shear stress at the wall. All right. Let me talk a little bit about Blasius' solution. Blasius, somebody, that's his last name did this work and he developed the mathematical solution to the laminar velocity profile. And so 
I'll go through it. It's in the textbook, and I'll show you where it's in the textbook. But if you wanted to re-derive Blasius' solution, you'd say, well, inside that laminar boundary layer profile, I need to obey continuity. Continuity has to work. It's good. So it's going to be steady state flow. It's going to be incompressible. So density is constant and two-dimensional in the Cartesian flow over the flat plate. Does that look good for the continuity equation? What's continuity again? Conservation of linear momentum? Mass. Conservation of mass. That's right. Then we go to the momentum equation. We'll just grab one of the components of the momentum equation. It's the x component of the momentum equation. Knock out all the non-zero terms. These are the surviving terms. And, uh, well, knock out all the zero terms. These are the non-zero terms. What do you have here? You have the change due to its kind of shifting because the flow at the uh, surface of the plate is zero. So it's going to have a little push up away from the plate. So you're going to have a little bit of a non-zero V in that boundary layer region, but just a little. Mainly it's changing U, changing U, okay? Changing it as a function of X, definitely as a function of Y definitely strongly changing as a function of y. And then what about this? That's our viscous term. So we expect that the boundary layer has some uh, shape to it and we expect it to have the profile to be um, similar to other profiles. So you, you introduce a similarity variable. Okay, well the genius it's, uh, that worked this out um, I'm not going to try and say I can justify it as if I was the first ever to solve this problem. Blasius is the first. He's recognized by it. But you do in engineering and science often find that you can look, you see the similarity in the profile, hence you look for a similarity variable. And so this similar variable is eta. It's the distance y from the plate out into the fluid divided by the speed divided by nu over x. Okay, so basically early on in the plate you have a very sharp profile. Later it's a thicker profile, but if you just took and stretched, stretched the two or compressed them in the y, they would be similar. They'd lay on top of each other. They have the same general shape. Well, introduce the stream function, which is good in two dimensions. And that then, if you find the stream function, it satisfies the continuity equation. Um, here is d psi dy, which is u, so u is v, then g, the, some function of the similarity variable. And it follows, after a few manipulations, that you can express v is equal to here. Well, what is f? Some function of the similarity variable. Then you employ the continuity equation that's bringing this line down here. What happens there? Well, you develop, basically you're collapsing a first order ODE and a second, not a, it's not an ODE, it's a PDE. First order PDE with a second order PDE, one and two equals three. I collapse it through the use of the similarity variable into a third order. Look at that, isn't that third order? third order ODE. So how do we often solve PDEs, partial differential equations? Bust them down to ODEs and then solve the ordinary differential equation. That's what you're doing right here with the similarity variable. Now you have to transform the boundary conditions. <laughs> so uh, this is one of the boundary conditions and when you transform it, it gives you this um, requirement on that function F. Okay, this, this, uh, uh, this new function f, which is very abstract, it's hard to interpret. But the second boundary condition gives you a, a boundary condition on the uh, derivative of f at eta equal to zero. And then the third boundary condition gives you the derivative at eta goes to infinity equal to one. So I have a third order O to E, three boundary conditions, it's a mathematical problem and then we solve it. So it's worked out in example uh, 1010 on page 565.
I think I copied it right here, at least the beginning of it. This is a chapter we skipped because there's not as much of the material in it that I needed to get to. So I'll just allude to this part as being used in this, what we did skip chapter 10. So laminar boundary layer on a flat plate. And so there's the discussion. And you get this, this um, solution looking for this abstract quantity F, this new uh, solution. And because of the boundary conditions, you're especially interested in the derivative and the font value of F at 0. And then when it's, the derivative is out, like 0.99, somewhere in this vicinity. So let me back up. So we find that you solve for f and the derivative of f. That's that table. And then you, know, you look and you say, what is the second derivative of f at a to equal to 0? That's a constant. And you interpret that as being able to say, this is the shear stress at the wall. That constant, 0 0.332 times rho v squared over the square root Reynolds number. Likewise, the when is the first derivative equal to 99%? That was our criteria about how thick it is. You find that, oh, it's when eta is equal to 4.91. Hence, the boundary layer thickness is equal to 4.91 divided by the square root of Reynolds. I'm giving you a warm, fuzzy overview. If you are going to go through this and very skeptically, you will prove it every step to yourself. It's going to take much more time than I have to devote to it, okay? But uh, this is non-trivial, but this is the ap type of application of the calculus and differential equations that uh, uh, we'd like you to master or at least know what's going on. So you have the equation then for the boundary layer thickness. This is a big deal. Congratulations, fluid mechanics. We have another analytic solution. We only have a few of them, but this is one of them. And then you can cast the... Uh, shear stress at the wall into dimensionless terms using the skin friction coefficient and you get this very compact form 0.664 divided by the square root of Reynolds number so in the laminar flow as you go further down the plate the Reynolds number linearly increases and so you're you're growing by 1 over the square root of x or 1 over the square root of x will actually make it diminish go down as it increases. So those are the two big contributions. Now, if you go to turbulent flow, you're, you have no analytic expression. You have to rely on experimental data or empirical data. So they want the same type of how does the boundary layer grow and what is the local skin friction coefficient. Let's take a look at... Uh, This table, 10-4, I tried to white out here <laughs> stuff that may just be distracting to your eye. When it's laminar, we're interested in the boundary layer thickness. That's what Blasius solution gave us. We're interested in the local skin friction coefficient. That's what the Blasius solution gave us. When it's turbulent, do I have the ability to do analytic solution? No, no, no. You have to rely on empirical data, and there's the consensus. When you have kind of a little bit of a model, a one-seventh power law model, this is about the profile in the boundary layer region, and a lot of experimental observations. You combine them, and you bring up this type of uh, correlation, and for the skin friction coefficient as well. Now, those are for the local and the local friction coefficient, often we're interested in the C of F averaged from 0 to L. Well, how would I get the average? Well, put 1 over L, integrate the, the local. Wouldn't that do it, from 0 to L? And you can do that for both of these cases. You could do it for the linear case, I mean, sorry, the laminar case, not linear case, as well as the turbulent case. And you'll get another equation. There's so many equations that students sometimes become bewildered. 
Which equation do I use? That's why I tried to cover up some of these equations. <laughs> but you do have laminar turbulent, local C sub F, average C sub F. Okay? Okay. So this is the calculate the average. You I put a bar on it saying average with the subscript L to emphasize it goes from X0 to L. And uh, you put in that 0.664 for the laminar case. You work it out and you end up with 2 times 0.664 or 1.33 divided by the square root of Reynolds number. When the Reynolds number over the entire plate, that means where is the Reynolds number going to be the largest? At the trailing edge at x equal to L is all less than half a million. So if it's always less than half a million and you want to know the average friction coefficient over the length of that plate, 1.33 divided by the square root of the Reynolds number at the trailing edge. You do the same thing for the turbulent. If turbulent, that was our model for the turbulent, we then want it the average and the math you know you can do this in Wolfram and you can kind of see with a 0.059 coefficient is transformed in a 0.074 coefficient 0.074 coefficient notice there's only two significant digits two significant digits it's it's turbulent flow <laughs> it's based on experimental data you don't get three and four significant digits on those measurements and what do they say here? They say, look, you need that flow to be sufficiently high Reynolds number at the trailing edge and that basically we're disregarding the laminar region early on and we're just going to say it's always turbulent. That's why they integrate 0 to L, not 0 to some critical length and then from critical to L. There's another correlation for that if you like. These are the type of equations, uh, problems that we would solve. I think we have just enough time to go ahead and solve this one. For laminar flow over a flat plate, if the fluid free stream velocity is doubled, so this is like case one, and this is case two. So in case one, there's the free stream velocity. In case two, there's the free stream velocity, but it's equal to two times the free stream velocity in case one. That's the information given, right? While the flow remains laminar, so it's not going to transition to become turbulent flow. It's all laminar. Calculate the change in the viscous drag force on the plate. Well, what's the viscous drag force on that plate? Is it going to be some average... Um, shear stress at the wall for the first case, some average, um, and then you multiply by the area? Would that work? How would I get the average um, of the shear stress? Would I use the C sub F over the whole plate from 0 to L? Sure. And then I would multiply that by to unravel it. 1 half rho V squared, but this, this is V1 because this is the, the first case. And this is C sub F L comma 1. And so what is uh, the average friction coefficient over the plate for this first case? Oh, I forgot my model. What was that solution? Was it 0.664 or 1.33? for the average. 1.33. 1.33. And then it was divided by the square root. Was it the divided by the square root? The square uh, root in the book on page 627. Uh-huh. Yeah. Then it's divided by the square root, right? Mm -hmm. uh, of the Reynolds number for case one. And the Reynolds number for case one is equal to rho V1 L divided by mu. True? So I'm kind of breaking it down here. Now, let's take a look over here. If I said, well, I, what is the Reynolds number for this second case? 
Well, it's going to be rho v2 L over mu. The L's the same, the rho's the same, the mu's the same. It's the V that's changed. So that's equal to 2 times V1 rho L over mu, which is 2 times the Reynolds number for the first case. True? Okay, good. And then the equation C sub F uh, L2, the second case, is the same concept, 1.33 and you're divided by the square root of the Reynolds number at 2, which is 2 times, so I'm going to have 1 over the square root of 2 times C sub F of L1. Did I leave out too many steps, or is that follow? Do you follow that? Good, good, good. All right, so now we're going to have the average shear stress over the wall for the second case is equal to this C sub F L2 which is 1 over the square root of 2 C sub F L1, boy, that's a bad looking C, times 1 half rho, but V I replaced by a V2, which is a 2 V1, and that's squared. So what I find is I find it's 4 divided by the square root of 2. Where did the 4 come from? 2 squared, and then divide by the square root of 2. Okay times tau w1 averaged. Make sense? And so the drag force for the second case is equal to 4 divided by the square root of 2 times uh, the tau1, uh, the force drag 1. Let's Okay, so then I take 4 and I divide it by the square root of 2, and it's 2.8, 2.83 FD1. So, if I just double the fluid free stream velocity and the flow remains laminar, I know it's, it's going to want to somewhere tr start to transition. Faster flow, want to be turbulent flow, but let's leave it all laminar flow, that's a big assumption. Calculate the change in the viscous drag force. Well, the viscous drag force didn't just double. It more than doubled. It's now 2.83 times the original viscous drag force. True? All right. Uh, this is the type of problem we'll solve uh, later, hopefully, the day before the last exam. Now let's talk about flow over cylinders. I wanted to get some illustrations out of the uh, different uh, sources, but um, because what happens is, is as the flow increases in speed, as the flow increases in speed, you have almost dramatically different flow field around the cylinder. So here is our cylinder. It's shown in black right there. And when it's very slow flow, you have what they call ideal flow, and it's always attached. What do you mean attached? There's no separation region, no weak wake region. And there's no backside where you have the, it separates. But, so the flow comes, it just skirts around, goes back. And I think I talked about that, and hopefully um, you can recall. So if I'm taking a look at four points, or three points, whatever number of points, and I say, what's happening to the, the flow in this little ch chunk right here? Is it speeding up? No, it's, it's a constant velocity. Is the pressure changing? No, the pressure. So we're looking two things always. What's happening to the velocity? Is it constant velocity? Is it speeding up? Is it slowing down? And the second, what's the pressure doing? Is it constant pressure? Is the pressure going down in the direction of flow or increasing in the direction of flow? And once you start to get closer, let's say it's a little bit off right there. What's happening to the velocity is it's getting closer now to this cylinder. The velocity is slowing down. What's the pressure doing? Increasing. And so what happens in this region right in here at the front of that cylinder? Talk about the pressure. High pressure. And if you're using Bernoulli's equation, 
The boost in pressure, the increase in pressure is due to the dynamic pressure or dynamic velocity or dynamic, it's one half rho v squared. Then go around the top quarter of the cylinder going this way. So there's my cylinder. I'm trying to enlarge it here. What's happening to the speed of the fluid as you're going around? It's going faster, faster, faster. What happens to the pressure? It's decreasing. It's decreasing. I know I'm saying it quickly, but we covered it last time. You really have to process this on your own, in your own mind, at your own pace. But talk now. We talked about this region being high pressure, low velocity. What about this region right up here? What type of, how about what the pressure is? You find it's really low pressure. What about the speed? High speed, high speed. Now you go around this way. What's happening to the velocity as I'm moving this way? Velocity is slowing down, slowing down. What about the pressure? Going back up. And talk about now the pressure in this region. It's high pressure. And what about the velocity? It's low velocity. And then once it moves out here again, okay, um, it's going to uh, be back up to regular velocity far away. So this is going to speed up a little bit. Speed up and the pressure is going to go back down a little bit, okay? So think of each one of these from here to here, here to here, here to here, there to there. And talk about velocity on each one of those little jaunts and pressure, okay? Well, this is when it, the Reynolds number uh, of the flow based on the diameter of the cylinder is very small. It's very low. What's low? Oh, less than one, one-ish. But as the flow speed increases, you develop a difficulty in navigating this turn around the backside. And you'll pick up these little, what are they showing right here? What are they showing right there? Little recirculation regions. And so there's the point at which the flow is separated, separated maybe at this point and it goes around like that and then you just have a recirculation region in there it's steady and they just have a little circulation region now uh, why did it separate because the f it's hard to, for the flow to navigate that turn what's the pr what's the velocity doing as it's coming on this back side right here what is the velocity doing in that section Velocity is going down, decreasing. What about the pressure? Going up. That's hard for flow to do. Fluid is like a bunch of kindergartners. They like to be pushing on the backs of the kindergartners up front in front of them, right? That push, 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 push. So high pressure on the, and then the low pressure over here, that's easy. But turn it around and it doesn't really work too well. It looks for an alternative route. It wants to separate. It wants to split off. So uh, fluid, uh, they'll, they'll, they'll break off, they'll separate. And so th what'll happen is you get that separation and then it develops that recirculation bubble or region right on the backside. Well, that's Reynolds number around 10. Okay, let's continue to speed up the flow. Well, what happens is this, this doesn't become steady anymore. It loses that steadiness. It becomes unsteady. And so the bubbles get larger. Those recirculation regions get larger. And then they start to oscillate. And then they can even break off and peel off. And so then you'll get uh, unsteady oscillating. The separation may move up further on the cylinder, move it up a little bit more because it's a higher speed harder for it to navigate the backward turn and then you'll get this uh, shedding of what they call vortices circulating one time it'll shed one way one time it'll rotate and shed the other way let's say you continue to increase the Reynolds number the speed 
Well, then it's oscillating and ripping off so fast, it's now a continuous ripping off. Okay? And it's like the separation points moved up quite a bit, maybe even moved up in here as you increase the speed, and you get basically a very large weight region where that's like a continuous chaotic shedding and it's a wake region of um, complicated flow. Now, up in this region, you still have that going from nearly zero flow up and increasing and getting very, very fast. And this always has some laminar part to it. And it can still be laminar until it hits the point where it separates. This is the big S, or here is the big S, wherever it separates, separation point. But if you really increase the Reynolds number, it will transition so that you have a laminar region, and then you'll have a turbulent region before you hit the big S. Well, what's the turbulent region do? Well, it's turbulent before it separates. And if it's turbulent in the boundary layer before it separates, turbulent flow, because it's all mixed up, and it can do a better job of navigating the turn around the back side of that cylinder. And if it can do a better job of, of turning around the back side of the cylinder, then that point of separation, S, moves back. And it makes for a smaller wake. Why again? Well, it was turbulent on the front side of that cylinder. Hence, because it's turbulent, it's able to navigate, push back to the point of separation, and so you get a smaller wake. Now, when you have a, a low, low Reynolds number flow around that cylinder, what dominates the drag? Viscous, viscosity. When you have a high, high Reynolds number, what dominates the drag? Viscosity or the other? I can't remember. What was the other? Pressure. Yeah, they call it form drag or pressure. Pressure. Pressure definitely dominates at high uh, Reynolds number. So you have a smaller backside in that wake region where you have very low pressure instead of a large region of low pressure. And so this is one of those great mysteries. It's like, hold it. <laughs> the flow is going faster, but the drag force can go down a little. The drag force can go down a little. It's really good to uh, try to uh, um, look at, again, what's happening. Right in this region, what they'll do is they'll try to draw different profiles going radial outward. Here's one, here's one. We could draw one here, draw one here, draw one here, draw one here. Okay. So look, first of all, plot the magnitude of the velocity. I know that we're exaggerating the distance away from the fluid. The boundary layer is very small and close to the cylinder, but if I look at it, What's happening is that velocity is getting largest until right here is the largest velocity at the extent of the boundary layer. And then it's going to get smaller again and smaller again in down in this region. Well, it's hard to show this because it's now in the wake region. But uh, so you're going to have this transition. That's the velocity profile. Then think about what's happening to the pressure as I move in this direction all the way up this quarter. The pressure is going down. That's a favorable, there it is, I spelled it right there, favorable pressure gradient, meaning the flow is accelerating and the pressure is pushing it. It's in the direction of decreasing pressure. That's what flow typically likes to do. If it has high pressure below, behind it and low pressure in front of it, it accelerates. 
it speeds up. That's what fluids do. That's called a favorable pressure gradient. But back on this side, we already know it's slowing down. What's the pressure doing? Increasing. That is not favorable. So they didn't say it's non-favorable. They just said it's adverse. I don't know why somebody chose some of these words, but it's adverse, okay? And everybody calls it an adverse pressure gradient, meaning the flow is slowing down, the pressure is going up. Now, if you follow a chunk of fluid that's not really close to the surface, but it's in the boundary layer, okay, that's okay. But if you, what's happening is the speed is going down. Think about Bernoulli's. The speed is going down. The one half rho v squared is going down. And what's going up is the static pressure, the combination, if mechanical energy is conserved, is, is constant. But what about the speed of a chunk of fluid that's a lot closer to the surface? It doesn't have a large V. It does not have a large V. It's smaller because the V goes to zero at the surface. It's no slip. It doesn't have a lot of kinetic energy in which to convert back to increasing pressure. So what happens is you get this kind of velocity profile which it pushes back, bulges back. Well, that's separation. So where do they define separations? It's when this velocity profile gets pushed and then the derivative comes in right in there. I know I need to blow it up. Maybe you can't see it that well, but it goes like that, the velocity profile. Because it's slow flow close to the solid surface, that's very, uh, it's where it's going to separate. You can exp uh, understand that hopefully. I think I have another illustration, yeah. So it's kind of pushing back. Why? Well, it had very low speed there, and as it's trying to increase the pressure, this is the same type of pressure increase felt out here, but here the speed is high. And so it can reduce some of the speed, and yeah, I can see how the pressure goes up. But there, it doesn't have a lot of kinetic energy in which, so it's going to bulge back, and this is where at the point where it separates, it comes in, that velocity profile is now normal to the surface, and that's the separation point. You can read more about it. Other people have done a great job of explaining it. If I've been a little confusing, please read, okay? So, so the net effect is you'll have a region for let's say a smooth cylinder, let's just do the smooth cylinder out in here. That's that uh, flow region where it's attached everywhere or it's steady and it has some recirculation region right behind it. Okay, so you can think of in here uh, that it's put the cylinder, put the flow field that just is attached everywhere, Stokes flow, or put the cylinder Ed, put it where you have a little um, recirculation region on those back sides, and the flow goes like that. But it's a steady, steady recirculation region. But then uh, you get into a region where the cylinder is getting higher and higher Reynolds number, see that? And the flow then starts to develop these a street a sequence of shed vortices. It's unsteady flow behind. And then it gets out into a region out kind of in this vicinity where it's more flat. And here I know there's some bumps to it, but still. Um, what's happening there? Well, we have the cylinder and the flow is coming in in its laminar and then it hits a point of separation and you get a wake region. And so in this wake region, uh, the, the drag coefficient bounces around a little bit, but it's really a log scale here, so it's pretty flat. It's pretty flat. And then this is that interesting dip. What? The drag coefficient drops. Why? because we have our cylinder 
and the flow always is coming at it and starting to bend in its laminar, but then it quickly transitions to turbulent flow. The turbulent flow is able to navigate further around the back side of the cylinder, pushing back the point of separation, S, the point of separation, making for a smaller wake. So we have a laminar and the turbulent. It's like, pull it, turbulent flow around that cylinder should increase drag, but because it does increase the viscous drag, but it really knocks down the dominant drag, which is the pressure drag. Hence, you have a lower net drag coefficient. For that speed, you would think that, hey, the drag coefficient should be up here, but at that speed, it'll be down there. So instead of being in the vicinity of one, it'll be in the vicinity of 0.3. So you'll be traveling at a speed and you'll be a lot lower drag coefficient. All right. So now, okay, you also have the same behavior for a sphere, but now it's more of a uh, polar coordinate system. Well, it's the same. It was polar coordinate for the cylinder, but it's more of a three dimensional. A flow field for the, uh, the the smooth sphere. The same behavior, okay? You get that laminar turbulent in the boundary layer right before separation, and then it drops the drag coefficient. Well, what they found was uh, you have a smooth object, a smooth sphere versus a rough sphere. And if you have a rough sphere, what does it do? It shifts over and earlier at a lower Reynolds number you could get that flow behavior because as you're going around that surface, that little bumps here help shorten the length or of the laminar flow. It turns more turbulent earlier. And when it's turbulent earlier at a lower Reynolds number, then it has the same effect of dropping because it's able to navigate and delay separation, creating a smaller wake region. Okay, so when you have a rough sphere, it can flow through air a lot easier. So this is the classic. Everybody should probably half of you already know this, but golf balls are dimpled. Why is there texture on golf balls? And I think they sell golf balls pretty expensive and probably somebody's bragging up their dimpling and their pattern of this is better for blah blah blah. So when somebody hits the golf ball, I don't play golf, but they try to hit it for distance and they want that golf ball trajectory to do not just this, they want the golf ball trajectory to do something like so that when it hits it kind of stays in that vicinity instead of hits and bounces. True? Okay, so they hit it and they have some spin. We'll pick up on that notion of spin in a minute. Okay? Such that it gives it additional lift. But they also are hitting a ball that's dimpled. And the dimpling on the ball helps. It's like a roughening on the surface instead of a smooth sphere. It's a dimpled sphere. So that at first, you have that laminar boundary layer developing, but then you want to transition it such that it becomes a turbulent boundary layer. The turbulent boundary layer can navigate better on the back side and delay the point of separation where if the, salt, if the ball is a uh, smooth sphere, the point of separation, at least on this illustration, is way here, much earlier. And hence, you get a thick, thicker wake, larger wake region, or a thinner wake region. Thinner wake, lower form drag, pressure drag. Lower net fo drag force for the same speed going through the air. Hence, the ball can go further as it's even slowing down. Okay. So, any, who plays golf? A couple of people. Do they sell expensive balls and cheap balls? And do they sell the expensive balls bragging up the dimpling? They do? Okay, there you go. I figured they did. <laughs> it's 
It's like our patented, our unique design of this dimpling will give you more lift. And I know also it's, it's how they make it on the inside such that when you whack it, it deforms a little bit and then likes to spin because you get that spin, it creates the lift too. Um, so. Why aren't dimples on planes and cars and truck surfaces if it's so great at reducing the drag? Let's take a little ball-peen hammer out to your car in a parking lot. Let's work on it, huh? Mm -hmm. Right? Let's save some money. You need the MPGs, miles per gallon. Well, here's the first clicker question of the day. You answer it. Most of the drag on streamlined objects like cars, planes, and trucks is due to friction drag. Most of the drag on streamlined objects like cars, planes, and trucks is due to form drag. Planes and trucks and cars don't want to reduce drag. It is difficult to dimple surfaces on planes, P-L-A-N-E-S, cars and trucks. And dimpling promotes turbulent flow, which produces a smaller wake region behind the object. Well, here goes. You try and figure the best answer for that. We don't dimple surfaces on planes, cars, and trucks. Why? Why aren't dimples used to reduce the drag? Did everybody get in on time? Wow, that's great. Uh, most of the drag on the streamlined object is due to friction drag. That's absolutely true. So I know that we still have a lot of form drag on trucks and cars and planes, but um, you're not going to, it's not like a sphere. It's not like a sphere or a cylinder. Um, you really have typically some abrupt changes. And if you want to streamline it, you'll have a bigger effect than trying to dimple it. Don't go pounding and ball peening your paint job on your car thinking that's going to help. All right, so there you go. Thank you. What is the purpose of dimpling on golf balls? Easy one. You read it. You got 30 seconds. Well, the, uh, the ball is not streamlined. True? A ball, if you had an object and you wanted to push it through air and you wanted to streamline it, and maybe this was the package, you know, that was very important, you'd probably put a little bit of a nose on it and then put a long tail like that and then try to keep it oriented. Maybe you put some fins on it, something. Hey, that looks like a bomb. Okay, fine. <laughs> but this is not a bomb. This is a sphere. It's not streamlined. Okay. Uh, what, what the key is, is you have high something and low something there. What's the high and the low that contribute to the drag? High viscosity or high pressure and low pressure? Which is, it's the pressure. It's the pressure, 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 pressure. True? All right. So all this pressure, 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 pressure. Now, it's not on the top and bottom side. So eh, it's, that's not it. On, you know, this is vague. But you're thinking about the front side and the back side. What would you like? Would you like uh, to, you, 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 on a golf ball, do you like drag? No, you want it to go far. You want it to go far with the easy whack off your club. So basically, this low pressure on the back side is no good. So you don't, you don't want it to make lower, you want to increase, increase the air pressure on the back side of the ball. All right, how would you decrease the air pressure? On, if you decrease the air pressure on the back side of the ball, wouldn't it make it worse? It would make it worse. So I know that these questions are tricky, but uh, they're, that's the best I can do at explaining it. Now, this illustration I grabbed because it shows you something. Here is a cylinder, and here is something of the same diameter, and it's streamlined, okay? It's streamlined, but it, if you look at it from a distance going this way, right, it has the same silhouette area. So the same projected area or frontal area. This object has a large separated flow region, a wake region. 
So if they put this as the length of this line as the drag force, they would bust it into two components. They would say the length is this component right here plus this component right there. They would say it's the combination of the skin uh, friction drag made black. See how thick it is, black, versus the uh, white or non-colored, the pressure, pressure. So for a blunt body, like a cylinder or a sphere, what dominates the drag force? The pressure drag. For the streamlined object of the same cross-sectional area, for the same projection, they're trying to show you not only have they reduced the magnitude of the drag force by having, there's no meaning of this dimension. It's always in this dimension that they're trying to show by this illustration. Okay, so it's reduced the drag force. And what about the viscous drag? Well, it probably went up a little. But what happened to the pressure drag? A lot. Because what's really, really small? The separation. Delay separation, help the flow navigate the contour on the back side of an object, small wake region, or eliminate the wake region if you could, and you will have low drag. In streamlined objects such as airplane wings, they create very little wake relative to the skin friction drag they experienced. True or false? Now, the other day, um, hey, why, why did one person do that? I thought it was going to be 100% correct. Um, it's true. It's true. Okay. The other day, I was asking, um, I did a lot of clicker questions last time we met as a class. True? Does that, nice because I was thinking, um, you just want to boost your 8% score overall for the class? Or is it nice because it keeps you more awake? Is it both? Okay, because I was thinking, I thought you would get tired of clicker questions, and it's like, uh, no, it seemed like you were enjoying them. <laughs> this is a type of problem we should solve before the exam. How about flow over an airfoil? What's the purpose of an airfoil to generate lift? And you don't want a lot of drag. Okay. So when you have flow over an airfoil, airfoils often are either symmetric or not symmetric. They're not symmetric. And so they'll have an axis. There's my axis. And they'll have some point and some point, some beginning, some ending point, the tips. Okay. And on the top side, they usually bulge up, and then they want to be slim coming down. And on the bottom side, they usually don't bulge that much, and they do something like that. Okay. Why? Because they want to split the flow. When they split the flow, they want this flow on the top to go F-A-S-T. What's the purpose of having fast flow on the top of the airfoil? Bernoulli's equation explains why. What happens when the flow speeds up? Pressure goes down. Okay. And on the bottom side, yeah, you're still typically going to bulge it out a little bit, but it doesn't go as fast, and so the pressure here doesn't go down as much, and so it's a little higher, and what's the pressure here is much lower. I should not use that term, pressure is higher below the wing, because comparatively, it's still, you know, if the wing bulges down a little bit, it's still going fast around it. Now, if the wing does something like this, it goes like this. Um, you know, then 
it could slow it down because it's bulging in, but I don't know too many wings that do that. Some of them may do that, but so basically the faster flow creates a low pressure and the wing is drawn up by the low pressure on top, not pushed up by high pressure below. The pressure at locations where the flow velocity is high and pressure is high at locations where the velocity is low. So the pressure is low at locations where the flow velocity is high. Is that true? And the pressure is high at locations where the flow velocity is low. You answer that. True or false? Hopefully that gave you enough time to really ponder what we're talking about, but because you're 100% you're correct, but that's the key. That's the key to these airfoils. Here's a question. At zero angle of attack, so I know that I have an axis for my airfoil, and I have the beginning point, the ending point, the tips, and then I say the lift produced by a symmetrical airfoil is zero. You try and answer that. So we have a zero angle attack. The flow is coming at my airfoil straight on. The lift produced by a symmetrical airfoil is zero. Well, the way you generate a symmetrical airfoil is maybe you generate the profile of it, something like this, and you only need to consider one side of it. Because it's symmetrical about the axis, you just revolve it around the axis. If you revolve it around the axis, you get something that's just perfectly the same. So uh, I know it, the, the word, the key word is symmetrical airfoil. Uh, it's, it's like a cylinder. It's, it's very hard to do this. But if you have the flow coming straight at it in the same profile and both sides, all sides, top side, bottom side. I know it's a, only an axis, so it's symmetrical. That yeah, it's zero. It is zero. It's it is zero. There's no way to give you speed on one side, low pressure, and slower speed on the other side, high pressure, and get lift. Let's uh, talk about minimum flight velocity. So we have a uh, surface of my airfoil. There's characterized by that plan form area looking down, okay? And uh, it's moving at a speed uh, through, let's say the air is coming at it at speed V, or it's moving through stagnant air at speed V. Change your reference thing, frame, okay? Um, when it happens, you will generate some lift FL. True? What is the equation for how to predict FL? Well, I'll predict FL if you can give me C sub L. I can't remember what C sub L is. C sub L is lift coefficient. It's experimentally tabulated. Okay. I multiply by the, is that the silhouette? It's the plan form area? Yeah, it's the plan form area. It's looking down area. And then I multiply by one half rho v squared. What's that one half rho v squared? The dynamic pressure. And that gives me the lift. Now, when I want to get off of the ground, that means that these little wheels down here that have been supporting me on the ground have no force from the ground holding me up again, right? I'm going to go airborne. That's my minimum flight. Flight meaning airborne. Minimum flight velocity. In that case, what has happened between the relationship of the lift and the weight of the object that the wing is attached to, the airfoil is attached to? One, the weight is equal to the lift. And what's the weight? I don't know, something like the weight of the aircraft is some mass of the aircraft. And then uh, G, isn't that the weight? And so then you have C sub L, A, one half rho V squared. If, if I told you the area, I told you the lift coefficient, the mass of the aircraft or the weight of the aircraft, could you then calculate that minimum speed? And if the speed was going faster than that minimum flight speed, you would get 
airborne and keep going up higher and higher and higher, right? You would get lift uh, that would exceed the weight. Which parameter does not affect the minimum flight velocity of an aircraft? All right, well, um, um, uh, this is a bad question in the sense of I have a, a not and none. That's called a double negative. But if aircraft weight is a, affects the minimum flight velocity, well, yeah, then I need to, then it's okay. And I look over here, guess what mg is? The weight. So that's okay. What about the air density? What is rho right there? That's air density. What about this lift coefficient? It's okay. Now, in the wings, you could do things to destroy lift or try to enhance lift, but it's going to be, I, know, I, I shouldn't have maybe put the word maximum. Sorry if that threw you for a loop. What about the wing area? That's okay and okay. All of those come into play if you wanted to calculate the minimum flight velocity. So the best answer is E. True? A loaded aircraft takes off at 250 kilometers per hour. What did they just tell me? They told me that lift speed. Okay, that's 250,000 meters per 3,600 seconds. Okay. If the weight of the aircraft is increased by 10% because of overloading, Determine the speed at which the overloaded aircraft will take off. So normally loaded aircraft takes off at that speed. What about an overloaded aircraft? What do you think? Do you think it's going to go off greater than 25, 250 kilometers per hour or less or equal if you overload the aircraft? It's going to have to be going faster down the runway before you take off, right? And so, nope, nope, right away. Not going to be the, any of those answers. So now I'm down to a 33% chance of guessing. But we recall the equation that the weight is equal to the lift force. The lift force is the lift coefficient times some area of the wing times some dynamic pressure. And there's that lift speed. That's the speed right there. So the speed is proportional to the weight square rooted. So if I have uh, the first case, and then the second case is the uh, 1.10 times the weight of the first case, then it's 1.1 square root times the velocity of the first case. So what is uh, one? It's 262 is the answer. And did we did we vote on this? I didn't get you to vote on. It. I'm sorry. Next time. Okay. On hot summer days, baseballs tend to fly farther in the ballpark. True or false? Some batter hits it. He hits it with the same bat, the same muscles, the same swing, the same pitch, boom. But it's a hot day at the ballpark. Is it going further? Yes. It is going farther. Okay, why? The air density? Yeah. Um, hmm. Um, when it, when the de when it's hot, this has lower density than when it's cold. The air density, cold air is more dense. True, true. Okay. Um, on a hot summer day, it's easier for aircraft to take off. False. It's not easier. If it's a hot, hot day on the tarmac in summer versus winter, uh, the aircraft is going to have to go faster. True? Okay. I'll do this one for a clicker. 
On hot summer days, it is easier for aircraft to land. Well, this is your call. Well, uh, this concept of landing, you have to really think through. Now, if I uh, have a helicopter, right, and it's running and the, the blades are going like this and then you want to land it, right, and so you bring it down to land, right, think about a nice landing, right? But then uh, we have a failure, the blades shear off, fly off like that. You know what? That helicopter is going to land. But it's not the type of landing you want to be in when that helicopter lands. Do, 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 does that make sense? And so it's kind of the word easier land. You want a gentle landing. You don't want to land like a rock. Now the aircraft comes in, right? And when it hits the tarmac, uh, if it's hot air, hot summer day, guess the speed at which it needs to come in to just touch down on that tarmac. It needs to come in faster because of the hot day. True? That's not good. It would be easier and better to come in slower and just touch down. Right? But right when it's touching down, you have that that minimum flight velocity of the aircraft, that minimum flight velocity is faster in hot air. So hot summer days, it's uh, not easier for the aircraft to land. They've got to come in faster to try and maintain smoothness. That was a tough question. The phenomenon of producing lift by the rotation of a solid body is called the Albert effect, the Tobias effect, the Logan effect, the Magnus effect, or the Obert effect. After the Austrian, Italian, Scottish, German, or American scientist, blah, blah, blah. Okay, just take your guess if you read the book, great. <laughs> All right, well, let's take a look. Very good, Magnus effect. And uh, so uh, the German scientist Heinrich Magnus, what did he do? What did he discover? Well, he discovered that a ball that's a symmetrical object, if it's rotating, you can change both the lift as well as the drag. First of all, if it's not rotating, if it's a symmetrical object, it ain't going to have any lift. <laughs> but you put spin on it, and now it has lift. And so that lift is going to make it go in a different direction. Uh, quick question, not clicker. Is a ball a symmetric object? True. Yeah, it is true. A spinning ball creates a non-symmetrical flow about the ball. True or false? True. true. And that's what gives it the lift, the, the, the non-symmetrical flow. And so if you have the ball, let's say right here, and it's spinning this way, omega, and the flow is this way. It tries to grab a little more flow, not 50-50, and, and, and bring it around that side. And when you bring more flow because of the spin to that side, guess what? It's going to go a little bit faster. And when it goes a little bit faster, the pressure is a little lower. And what direction does it pull the ball? force lift in the direction of the lower pressure. How many people have seen balls that spin either soccer ball, tennis ball, ping pong ball, uh, baseball, what am I missing? But where the people actually ping, uh, billiards, but that's a different one. It's not biting at the air, it's on the, on the um, table um, for the English, you know, the spin on the ball. So forget billiards. But where you kick it, it's going through air, or hit it, and it's going through air, or going through some fluid, and it's actually curving. Have you seen it? Which one? What's your favorite sport? Tennis? Actually, don't they put the spin such that when it hits the ground, it bounces? Does tennis uh, put spin where it actually curves in the air? I don't know. It does? Okay. I know when it hits the ground, it can do some funny things with the way it bounces. 
Um, but uh, ping pong, uh, yeah, you can see that spin as well as when it hits the table, how it comes off the table. But soccer is really one where you can kick it and it spins, right? Um, and uh, definitely golf, definitely golf balls. And so when they hit that golf ball, they're getting it to spin such that uh, as it moves into, so if, it's, if the golf ball's trying to go in this direction into the air at a slight angle up, it would want to have a spin in this direction to have more lift to then stay airborne longer. Yeah. So what you have is this has a plot here of this uh, lift coefficient on the smooth sphere due to the rotation. This is very old data, 1938, but uh, it just shows you how the spin does change it. We're finished with that chapter. So we talked about rotating balls and having the lift effect on it. Talked about form drag, separation of wake regions, adverse and favorable pressure gradients and flows over cylinders and spheres. Look good?